Would you like to win and achieve success at what you do? Welcome to the Winner's Ways Podcast, where we create winners every day. And now, your host, the author of Winner's Ways book and life coach, Bola Alabi. Hey everyone, welcome to another exciting edition of this uh, podcast. This is the Winner's Ways podcast, as you know, and this is where we talk about successful strategies. Uh, We share strategies, winning ideas with our audience so that they can, you know, adopt those strategies and also win in their lives. And today, I'm excited uh, because we have a guest with us. Uh, we have Sri, uh, Sri Shalapa, uh, who is the president and co-founder of Engagely, an Inc. 5000 company. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Sri introduce himself to, the, to you guys so that you can get to know him better. So, hey, Sri, welcome to the show. Oh, well, thanks a lot, Bola. It's it's a pleasure to be uh, part of your show, and I uh, hope we have a you know great conversation here. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. So uh, let's uh, get to know you better, Stree. Uh, can you please uh, tell us about you, what you do, and uh, what uh, my audience will learn from you as we uh, speak today? Okay, absolutely. Um, so I just to give a quick background. You know, I'm originally from India. I moved here when I was 21. Um, and my background has been in engineering and management from an education perspective. But I've done like five other things along the way in the last, uh, you know, 20 plus years of uh, in active working life. Um, part of that has been running, you know, uh, successful startups, uh, Engagely right now, which is a HR uh, tech platform for employee engagement, performance management, and uh, employee learning, de- learning and development platform is an Inc. 5000 company. We started that about seven years ago. So it takes a long time to be, <laughs> to be very successful. So I think we still have a long way to go ahead of us. And then before that, I was running a healthcare uh, tech services company. I was one of the uh, four main partners, uh, and which was also an Inc. 5000 company. Uh, and I exited that a few years ago. Um, so we had a very successful exit. Um, it's a uh, it's a very successful company that's on its way to being a unicorn soon. Um, but uh, so those are my two big successes there along the way, you know, I've had other passions and I've, you know, worked on how to figure out how to integrate those passions with my life. Uh, so that includes, you know, making movies uh, I've produced uh, written and or directed uh, about five feature films that have gone on to different uh, cable channels like Showtime, uh, 20th Century Fox, uh, Netflix, Prime, Tubi, other, other channels like that. Uh, two documentaries on top of that. Uh, now I also run a recording studio for independent uh, you know, musicians. And I'll be looking to start a music label as well on the side. So quite a few things along the way. Um, and I love to, I guess, talk about how to balance uh, your life and your health and your mental agility while doing you know, more than one thing at, at a time. Wow, that's awesome. You have quite a rich uh, resume right there, Sri. Uh, and we have uh, some identical background here. Uh, I'm also an engineer by background, and uh, I'm also an immigrant, <clears throat> as you may have guessed. So, um, I, and I like your, you know, the story you just shared about uh, your company, and which we are going to get into later, uh, Engagely, you know, because this uh, podcast is about, you know, sharing strategies, sharing stru- successful strategies. And of course, definitely you have some uh, success uh, that you've already accomplished. And I know my audience, they will be uh, eager uh, to learn from you. So um, let's talk about startup. Uh, you know, you 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 started Engagely, and uh, you also spoke about the healthcare tech company that you started. So, what led you to starting these businesses, if I may ask? Well, the healthcare tech I didn't start. I was one of the partners that led the growth. Um, 
so I joined in a little bit later. But I think the just to just to be clear, there so there's no miscommunication. But we did uh, grow that company fifty fold uh, in my uh, period running that running that uh, uh, part of the company. So the startup ecosystem is very attractive for people, I guess, like me who like to have creative control and are willing to execute hard and without having people ha- having to ask for permission. Right. So let's say you're in a company and let's say you uh, are an engineer and you say, you know, I have some ideas on how to market this product better. If you have that level of freedom where you can work with marketing and you can work with your CEO and be able to execute on your ideas and at least try them out, you know, not every idea will be successful, but you're not getting shot down for your ideas. Um, I think that's perfectly fine place to be, you know, but there are, those places are very hard to find. You know, if you work for a large fortune, fortune 1000 companies, most companies, would be like, you know, you play in your sandbox, don't come and tell marketing what to do. Don't, uh, you know, talk to our salespeople about things that you want to do and confuse the situation or whatever the reason may be. Um, and if they feel like they're working on things that doesn't excite them at, at all, or if they're working on things that they know is not the right thing to be working on because the market is changing, then, you know, then entrepreneurship is, is for those people, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I would say that's what dra- drove me because I was working in consulting. Um, I felt I was just doing a lot of things without really seeing the results of it myself because you move on from one client, to another client, to another client. I wanted to own the outcome as well and be able to work on the strategies and implement them. Uh, because a lot of the times customers just ask you to do a certain thing and then they want you to go away, right? Yeah, um, so I think that was my reason behind doing entrepreneurship because I could blend my creative juices with, uh, working on the execution part of the of the of the plan, and and see some success. And um, so far, it's been a good ride. Nice. So you you spoke about the freedom that you get, you know, uh, in a startup, uh, the flexibility and uh, the ability to execute. And I think those are very very important. So when we think about the startup space. Um, what do you think it takes uh, for a business uh, to be successful in terms of, you know, because there are quite a number of uncertainties, you know, you are just bringing up all these ideas together. What are those essential ingredients uh, as that you may, uh, that you say, these are the things that are, you know, important for a startup to become a successful business down the line? What, what are those things in your opinion? Well, one is you have to be comfortable with not knowing all the answers and with the uncertainty of a startup. You have to be comfortable with that. Um, if you are looking for very clear answers and clear solutions and clear outcomes very quickly, you're gonna be highly disappointed and that's when people quit. So if you are comfortable with uncertainty, I think that's a, a key ingredient of running a, s- a successful startup. The second start, uh, I would think, I would say is a strong sense of conviction in your belief. Uh, because if you are not convinced that this is going to work, then you can't convince others to buy, buy what you're building either. So the conviction in your belief is paramount that what you're building is essential and it, it's, it is solving is at least a specific problem in the market that maybe the market is not uh, catch, catch, you know, caught on to yet. The third thing is people give up too soon. It takes a long time for startups to be successful. All these overnight successes that you read about, like Instagram or something else, some of them have been in years in the making and some of them are in the news only because they have been overnight successes. But there are businesses around you everywhere and some of them take taken decades to build. Um, an example of a startup in, in the UI, uh, in the uh, robotic automation space, if you've heard of a company called UiPath, which yeah. is a 30, 20, some billion dollar company now publicly traded. UiPath was started by an Eastern European person. I forgot the name uh, of the individual and the country he's from, but it took him 10 years to get to 1 million in revenue. And then in the next five or seven years, they were at multiple billions in revenue. Oh. And it's because of, it takes a long time to build that. If most people would have given up in that time period um, and, and not 
really adjust it because you have to be at the right place at the right time. And sometimes you're not at the right place at the right time. Maybe you have the right product, but the market's probably not ready for you yet. You know, so you have to be really be, uh, be patient and continue working on it. Be, com- be comfortable with the uncertainty and have very strong conviction um, around your offering. So those are some other things I would say are very important. Uh, there are obviously other few other things that you should take into consideration. Obviously, having a good team, having good partners, having uh, being getting lucky along the way. You got to get lucky. You got to get get lucky with the one or two customers that fund your startup. You know, because you can only go so long funding it yourself. Um, so there are some elements of luck that, but but it takes patience. You know, if you're ready and you and you work hard and you focus on the market and you focus on your product. Um, eventually you will get lucky. Absolutely. So uh, I like that you said people need to be able to, you know, start without knowing all everything, right? Uh, Ability to face uncertainty. You talked about having that strong conviction that, hey, this business is going to be successful and as a believe in whatever you are doing. Uh, You spoke about perseverance, you know, because, Uh, People give up too soon. Uh, That's very important. People shouldn't give up. Uh, You talked about patient because when you start, you may not see results immediately. You need to keep doing it, keep innovating, keep uh, getting better. Then maybe after a while, you may be seeing, you will be seeing results. And you said, you spoke about the importance of having the right team and partners uh, alongside you. So that's very important. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that with us. So let's look at Engagely, uh, your company. Uh, do, do you want to, I know uh, it's a uh, employee engagement uh, company, but do you want to break it down for us? What do you guys do and uh, who, are the, who are your customers, uh, if I may ask? Yeah, so the problem that we are solving in the market today is organizations are struggling to retain their employees. They're struggling to connect their employees, especially as they get more more and more distributed. People are working remotely in different offices, in a distributed environment. Organizations, even as small as 50, 100 people, now have people working in three or four different locations at the minimum. Uh, Not everybody is co-located. So you need a software to connect them, engage them, where they feel like they're part of a culture, they're getting tools to learn and grow. They're getting, uh, you know, transparency of the objectives of the organization and their purpose. And our tool solves those problems, right? So our tool essentially provides a common space uh, in in the we call it HR tech because it is people management platform essentially, uh, where employees can collaborate. They have social tools. They have recognition tools. They can take online training within the platform. They can uh, set their goals and align their goals to organizational objectives. Um, So there are multiple things like that in the platform that allow people to work as one cohesive organization while they're not in the same room in the same office, right? And that's essentially what we do is provide the platform for organizations to be able to run a a highly, what I call a highly engaged, high high performance team. Oh, perfect. So uh, basically your business uh, is a B2B kind of uh, right. business. Okay, that's good. That's good. So we've talked about uh, startup. Then for every business uh, that uh, you start, you want to grow as well. Uh, what will you say uh, it takes to grow a business? You know, because let's say your business is making a million dollars today, uh, two to five years from now, you may be targeting $5 million in revenue. So what are those essential things that uh, an entrepreneur must know in order to grow their business? Yeah, I think the problems, as you get bigger, your only problems don't go away. They just change. Right. So what you have as a problem when you're starting off the ground. And if you solve those problems, you'll get to one million, let's say. Right. At one million, you have a different set of problems now. Now, now you have, let's say, 50 customers making one revenue, uh, one million in revenue. Your question is, how do I now scale it to get to 500 customers? Right. And that's a different set of problem because another problem is not about getting revenue. It's about building a brand. 
and and competing with the the big fish out there, right? Because there's there are companies that are probably have five thousand employees, uh, five thousand customers. How do you compete against them? So now you have a different problem uh, in that sense. You may have problems around infrastructure of being able to give effective support. You know, a, a founder or a CEO or a president can give a support to two or three customers. But once you have 50 customers, you need to provide the same level of personalization and the culture and the support to those customers, whether you're at five customers or 50 customers, and then figuring out how to scale the governance of your organization around that. So the problems keep changing. So you got to keep solving newer and newer problems. Um, and I think the key is to identify very clearly what those problems are at that stage. Um, so if you are at, let's say, 5 million and you want to get to 50 million, my problems at that point would be, how do I solve a brand recognition where I can scale? And how can I scale more eff efficiently without having to cold call thousands of people every month, right? And so your problems at that point will be figuring out how to do things at scale by using more automation, being more smart about it, building a better brand, building a better product that scales, building a better uh, process for support and uh, and existing customers as well, because you don't want to lose customers as you grow either. So that's, I think, is the key is to really, and every business will have different set of problems. So there's not one answer I can give. I think the key is to really hone in down and, and figure out what is your current problem that is preventing you from scaling, right? And that and that, and only the entrepreneur in that seat can really answer the question. Oh, perfect. Uh, so you talked about brand recognition, you know, building your brand. Uh, I especially like uh, the idea of uh, automation. You know, you have to look at the process. Uh, if your current process attracts only 10 people, what can you do to scale up so that the process or the whether it's using automation can attract 100, you know, so that's uh, very important. And you say you must do this without uh, neglecting your current uh, customer because they are the uh, revenue stream and you have to continue to make sure you treat them nicely. So that's that's good. Uh, thank you for sharing that uh, with us three. So um, you see, there are quite a number of people that may have a business idea on their head that, hey, I want to start this certain business, whether it's in real estate or healthcare or any business as, uh, uh, as the case may be. How can you, you know, they call it market research or vis feasibility study. How can you vet your idea be before, you know, you start spending your time on the business or before you start investing your capital on the business? How can you, you know, vet it and at least have some maybe 50% probability that, hey, this business can be successful. Is there any process for checking that? Um, the true, true way of measuring whether this is something that is valuable is see if somebody will actually pay for it, right? There are a lot of people say, oh, yeah, this is cool. I might use it. You know, it's great. But is that person willing to pay even a dollar for it? Right, and that's when you know that 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 idea is is totally is worth it. Um, because many, and and many times you hear ideas. I hear ideas from entrepreneurs and want to be entrepreneurs all the time. Many other time, it looks like what what I've seen is they come up with an idea or a solution, and then they start looking for a problem. It's like a solution looking for a problem to solve, instead of the opposite way of a problem that your solution solves. First, identifying the core problem that you're trying to solve. Right. Um, so identify what core problem you're trying to solve and who uh, are you trying to solve the problem for? And then ask them about the, the, whether the solution addresses that problem. Right. So that's the first is to, is to, is to validate your problem first and then, then validate the solution for that problem. So I think that's one way to go around uh, getting that feedback. So I'll give you an example. You know, when Engagedly started, we were trying to solve the employee engagement problem, which is the name Engagedly, right? And our solution at that point was, uh, this is year one of our startup, was to build a social platform for organizations where employees can be on an internal Facebook. And it's like a Facebook style, but different, slightly different, where they can share documents and ideas and, you know, 
uh, and, and give each other praises and things like that. Seems like something everybody would need, right? Yeah. Well, that's what we built it. And we built it. And I've, I've, I can tell you after talking to about 100 customers, I could not sell a single single license. Um, I had a couple of pilot customers, so I'm not counting them, you know, but I'm talking about if, if for six months, I was talking to customers and giving them demos. And I realized it was a problem that was there, but people were not willing to pay for it, right? So we did a small pivot where we added some of these strategy oriented stuff, right? Building a performance management platform, tying employee performance to engagement. And suddenly our sales just started taking off. You know, in one month, I closed my first five customers after not closing any customers for six months. Mm, wow. um, and then that's how, that's how I knew, okay, I have some product market fit. So being able to learn from the market. And so you may, so the thing is, if you're trying to find a perfect, so here's the key, right? If you're trying to find a perfect solution for a problem, you may not find it, but but the important thing is to get started so that you can eventually discover it. Uh, because there is a discovery process along the way, which only happens once you start. Because you will never, I mean, I'm not saying never, some people get lucky and they find it, but sometimes it takes time to discover the real solution to the real problem. Wow. So I, I totally get that. So that's very important. So the core message there is that uh, we need to validate the problem. Uh, there must be a problem Then you now find a solution to the problem Then you'll be able to sell. So that's uh, very important. Now, in terms of startup, uh, definitely there are times you can go alone. Uh, but I also know that there are some time you may need to find partners, you know, uh, so that you can work with other people to build the business. So how do you do that? How, is there, I, I don't know if you have partners uh, with you at Engagely, uh, your first business, of course, you were part of a team. So how do you find the right people on board uh, with you so that you can you know, work together to grow the business? I think you, my philosophy and my experience, not just with me, but looking at other entrepreneurs who have partners, is that it is serendipitous. It just happens where you find a partner and somehow you align an idea. Um, so if you look at Apple, right? When Steve Jobs met with um, Steve, uh, what's his last name? I forgot. What's his name? Yeah. Was Steve Wozniak, right? They met and they had this idea together and they started together. I don't think Steve Jobs would have done it by himself uh, or Steve Wozniak would have done it himself. They were very complimentary. Yeah. Uh, obviously, then after that, the paths went separate ways and, you know, Apple is the largest or most, you know, uh, expensive company out there today. But I think, uh, so it, it happens like that, right? If you look at uh, Tesla, Elon Musk actually did not start Tesla, even though people think he did. You know, he came in a little bit later Yes, uh, and took, I guess took credit first for being the founder, but that's fine. But he had partners who had essentially who had started it before, but they couldn't figure out how to scale and build and do that. And Elon had that grit and and uh, and uh, the uh, audacity to make that work. Um, same thing is true with uh, you know even uh, Microsoft. You know, you know Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer and some other people who started that. Um, not Steve Ballmer was. Uh, um, some of the person, Paul Allen, Paul Allen and, yeah. and, uh, and Bill Gates. So there are actually very few startups where one person is completely responsible for the success from day one. There are examples of that. And a lot of them happen because they just run into each other, you know, uh, at, a, at a company they work together or maybe at, they met somewhere and they started talking about an idea and they aligned the idea. So that's how you find a partner. I think if you have an idea and you, you force fit a partner that doesn't work, um, and I have seen that fail multiple times, even if the partner seems so good on paper, like this person is really good at sales. I'm really good at building the product. And the person expresses some interest, but there's not alignment of their approach, alignment of their, uh, you know, where to compromise, you know, where somebody might say, okay, I'm going to trust your approach on this, but I'm, but trust me on this part of the business. And those things sort of all work out. And that alignment only comes you know, after having worked together a little bit or maybe running and, you know, having more discussions about it. Okay, so that, that's good. Um, now, we know that there are some times when you, you know, start your business uh, and you want to keep growing the business. Uh, there's a piece, uh, and that's funding. Uh, maybe you 
you may not necessarily have all the funds uh, by yourself to uh, grow the business. How do you go about, you know, raising funds uh, so that you can continue to grow the business? You know, unfortunately, there is no easy answer to that. Um, if you notice how people get funding, it's all based on who they know or where they are. And there's a reason why there are so many startups getting funded in San Francisco or Boston um, or Austin, Texas now, to some extent. You know, if you start a business in Mobile, Alabama, I think you might have a tough time getting funding for your SaaS startup, unless you are connected to some rich, you know, country club family or something like that. You know, it's, it's, it's really ultimately, a lot of it is luck. Um, you know, you saw this, I don't know if you, if you saw this uh, startup that went bankrupt um, after raising $120 million called Reach. I think it was called Reach or Fast. It was called Fast. Mm-hmm. It was a payment startup, raised $120 million last year, a payment processing startup funded by Stripe, uh, which is a big oh, $120 million cool. startup by itself. Um, they blew through $120 million only had $600,000 in revenue to show for it and had to shut down operations uh, two weeks ago. So on what basis did they get funding? You can't say it was based on revenue. It was obviously based on some ideas that they had and obviously who they knew being in San Francisco helped in that case, right? right. So for so that, I think that's the hard part. You know, so if you are in one of these tier two or tier three cities, it's going to be harder, but ultimately, you know, I am in St. Louis, which is also one of those cities where there's not necessarily a lot of funding and there's necessarily a lot of uh, recognition for startups, even though it is, it is getting better. There's, there, are, there are about two or three VCs in St. Louis as well, but um, you know, the success goes up based on the network you build to some, to some extent, you know, ultimately you have a network. And then if you continue to build your network and show results, you show that you're continuing to build something, I think people will invest, you know, because here's, it comes back to that having that conviction, right? You can't just be running around with a PowerPoint all day long. You have to actually start building something with what you have, the resources you have, and then keep keep talking to investors about it. Um, some people just, you know, empty out their retirement funds and, and start a business, right? So if you really believe in your business, do it. That's, if that's, that's how you, then you're paying for it by saying, you're saying that I believe in this enough to, is to liquidate my 401k or liquidate my IRA or sell my house or take a second mortgage in my house. You know, awesome. I, I, I wouldn't talk people out of it. And there are a lot of financial advisors say, don't do it. I'm saying, if you believe in your idea, do it. Right. I like that. Uh, you know, there are quite a number of people that, you know, they just, we draw money from their 401k and just put all the money on their uh, business. Yeah, some some will go on to succeed and some will fail. But, you know, you don't know what you can achieve until you actually try it. So that's uh, very good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sri, for sharing that uh, with us as well. You are a busy man, Sri. Uh, I see that uh, apart from running uh, your business, you also, you are a filmmaker, you know, having produced seven uh, films and documentaries. Uh, you also are on a music production studio uh, that should keep you busy. I always talk about work-life balance here on my show. So how do you relax? How do you balance, you know, being busy, being productive, making money with, you know, maybe spending time to relax on why and just enjoy yourself? Well, I, I think this is how I enjoy myself. <laughs> so to me, work life is the same. It's, it's, uh, it's all integrated. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for example, this morning or yesterday morning, you know, I, I uh, woke up early did my uh, calls. I have teams internationally, so I have to wake up pretty early to do my calls. And then I took an hour off to go and go to the gym and work out. And then I came back and started, you know, working again uh, on my, on my other projects on like the music and film related projects in the evening. So you just figure out what schedule works for you, you know? Um, And I think that's why the flexibility of that schedule is one of the reasons why I didn't want to be in that eight to five punch the clock, show up at an office space type of job uh, for very long. 
Um, I did that for eight years and I decided it wasn't for me, you know, even though the, the security of a paycheck was great and I was going to, I was doing great. You know, I was on my path to being a, a partner at a big five and uh, I decided I just didn't want to pursue that path. Um, so anyway, I think it's, it really comes down to how do you want to live your life? You know, even if there's some uncertainty brings some flexibility and ability to pursue my passion, being able to uh, spend time with friends and uh, family and other things, you know, I think, uh, you really need to plan that out a little bit better. So the other thing is I use my calendar very effectively, right? Everything is in my calendar. So my workout is in my calendar. My time with my daughter is in my calendar. My, my, all my travels are sometimes plans, planned weeks in advance. It's also on my calendar. So if you put it on your calendar, that's one way to committing to that. You need to commit to time for yourself, uh, whether it is reading or if you're writing, you know, I'm working on a book, which has been a little bit of a struggle. I'll, I'll be honest. So I need to do a better job of blocking time off to write, you know, and blocking time off to do things I really enjoy doing. So I, I, I will say I succeed probably eight out of 10 times. There are two out of 10 times I don't succeed in that myself. Yeah, so uh, I, I get that. We are all work in progress. I also, you know, try to block calendar, you know, just to make sure that I'm prioritizing my time, uh, but I still struggle with that as well. Uh, but I get it. Uh, work-life balance is about, you know, focusing on those fun things, productive things in our lives and allocating time, uh, you know, so that we are uh, productive and we optimize our time. So that's very good. Uh, thanks again for sharing that. Okay. So uh, I do not want to, you know, create an impression that all is about success or everything that you touch turns to gold. And whenever I bring in a guest uh, on my show, I always ask them this question, you know, and it's about maybe mistakes that you've made in your career or in your business and the lesson that you learn from it. Because for me, you know, mistakes, um, if you uh, use them properly, they make you better. So if you don't mind, can you share maybe one business mistake that you made and uh, what lesson you learned from it? Oh, boss. I mean, I, I think we've made so many mistakes. It's not just one, you know. Um, so uh, some of the mistakes are really, I wouldn't call them fatal mistakes. So thankfully, they were not fatal. Um, you know, we could have raised funding sooner we just raised funding last uh, couple of months ago for on a series a on our on our startup uh we could raise our funding sooner uh getting the right people hired sooner is some of the things that i could have done a better job at um but nothing fatal so far uh thankfully uh i have done some mistakes on um, my film projects, for example, you know, I've made a lot of, I made a, quite a few films, and most films uh, actually lose money. Uh, independent films, especially, I would say, ninety-five percent of the independent films, if not more, lose money. Um, so I think one way to look at it is making a movie itself is a mistake. <laughs> you have odds are so stacked against you yeah. uh, because you can't compete with, you know, Netflix's own production and Prime's own production. I mean, it's pretty much like a oligopoly in the, in the in that market you know it's like making music you know you can make all the great music you want but you can't get through and 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 beat through all the record labels who have pretty much cornered the market and the airwaves and the and the all, all the recommendations on pandora and spotify so it, it really depends on if you look at it as a mistake or if you're just looking at it as following your passion and see whether it falls you know um so i think those are some other mistakes i've made in the sense of you know, making some of, some of the, a couple of the films I made, I probably didn't have the right people in promoting it. Um, I did get uh, some of the mistakes I made was trying to go with some distributor that uh, and ended up screwing me over and we never got the money and we had to go to court and things like that. But you don't know what you don't know until after the fact, right? You don't know who's going to come and cheat you until later. Um, so I think those are some of the things I would say. Uh, some of the things I wish I had done differently was having a better health and workout regimen in my younger years. You know, I was fairly uh, sporty and athletic, but I didn't have a very strong regimen, um, both in terms of eating well and working out well, um, which I do now for the most part. 
I think those things, uh, you know, uh, I would say are some of the things I would have done differently in my younger years. Uh, so that, that's a very good uh, life lesson that you just share with us, uh, you know, balancing all these things, whether it's exercise, whether it's uh, diet, uh, those things are very important. And the, the core message here is that uh, mistakes, uh, if we, you know, uh, learn from it, we are going to get better. So as we are rounding up on this uh, interview three, uh what message do you want to leave with uh, uh, my audience? And uh, also, how can they, you know, connect with you so that they can, you know, whether it's on Engagely or, or, or on any social media so that they can, you know, connect with you and know you better? Okay. Um, the message I would say, I'm going to go back to the movie analogy. This, your life is your movie and you're the star, right? So, make sure you're playing the right role as a star of your film, right? And so, so just think, look back and say, is this the movie that I'm a star in? Is this what I want to be a star in? And is this the kind of star I want to be in that film? Because, and, that, and, the, and the movie only runs once, right? So, so just, just, I'm saying, just, just take that into perspective as you're living the, the movie called Life and you as the leading star in that film, uh, if if that is what you want to you want to be playing, uh, to reach me, obviously my name is uh, Shrikant Chalapa or Sri Chalapa, uh, president co-founder of Engagedly, which you can read here if you're seeing the video. E n g a g e d l y. I'm on LinkedIn uh, as well as Twitter, uh, so they can follow me there. Um, they can reach out to me uh, on those channels as well. Awesome! Thank you very much, uh, Sri. We have come to the end of the interview. I hope uh, you guys uh, found this uh, helpful. Uh, we talked about startup, funding, partners, and the mindset that it takes, you know, to achieve success. Uh, I've benefited a lot from uh, this conversation. Thank you again, uh, Sri. Uh, till next time again, guys, keep winning. Keep winning, guys. This episode of Winner's Ways podcast has come to a close. We hope you enjoy and learn something from today's show. We want you to win and excel in all areas of your life. And we regularly explore and share information with our listeners to empower them to win. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast for more tips and strategies to help you find the success that you've always dreamt of. And don't forget to rate and review so that we can continue to bring you more podcast episodes to empower you. We will love to have you again next week. Now, keep winning.